Hello, everybody. Thank you, thank you for coming. This is the last thought of the day, so thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs> OK. So I'm Guillaume Akiné. I'm a software architect working for Thales. And I am Alexi Bona, and I'm also a software architect at Thales. So we are both working with our buddies here uh, on this kind of product. This is a big picture of the product. So as you can see uh, on the top here, you have this data center that is also on this table that you can also see at the Thales booth at KE34, right? OK, and OK, so thanks to this uh, data center, onboard data center that we call, surprisingly, ODC, um, we can run di different kind of workloads uh, on board. So depending on your use case, it could be connected to different equipments, notably the, the cabin, could be seat backs, it could be a access point serving for uh, personal electric device, devices, electronic devices. It can be uh, connected to the connectivity, um, and that's pretty much it. This data center itself, as the edge part, is connected to the ground platform through the, through the SATCOM. So either SATCOM or when we're on ground, we have the four, 5G or 4G connectivity. And this platform uh, provides with a portal uh, for all the stakeholders, so airlines, uh, third parties. Uh, as Thales, we also operate uh, via this, uh, this, this uh, portal. So when we started to work on this project, uh, it was in 2020. Uh, so we had the, this top four tasks to tackle. So obviously, the hardware is the big part. So um, we, I'm, I'm glad I don't, I don't do a hardware because they had a, a great challenge to, to face. Um, we, they have to comply with the DU 160, which is environment constraints. Um, and just to give you a bit of idea, this wall box only consumes uh, 300 watts. So technically, it's uh, not more than a hair dryer. Uh, yeah, and power is one thing, but cooling is another, and uh, this is one of the biggest challenges as well. You have to make, make, be able to cool the, this stuff, and sometimes temperatures grow very high, uh, especially uh, when you're in the Middle East on the tarmac, so it can be a, a big deal. Once you have the hardware, you bring on top the, the software. So with my team, we were working on uh, especially the, the lowest part of the software. So being able, between the hardware, bring the OS on top of it, be able to deploy the OS over the air. Uh, there are various topics, provision, provisioning is part of it. Um, and as so we wanted to assemble the current communities cluster on that. We obviously had a, a team working on the, the grand infrastructure. This is a big part but, but we, that we won't cover today. And we have, of course, services that we want to bring uh, on this, uh, in this system that uh, can be either full on board, on ground, or end-to-end -end services uh, that, uh, that uh, are deployed. And Alexi will uh, show you how they, they manage to deploy that. So first part, I'm talking about the, the operating system. This is something that is very common. You have two types of operating system. One is called factory because it's installed during manufacturing stage. It won't change over the, the product life. Uh, so this one has a single role that is to, 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 to roll, but provisioning, provisioning the blade and be able to upgrade to the production OS. The production OS is the one that will assemble uh, and bring the communities uh, up on board. So in terms of design, so we made this uh, operating system layered because uh, pretty much like a container, because it, it comes with great um, properties for us, especially when you work in Avionic, you have to be very strict on the security. So building the OS as a layer, uh, like we see on the, on the right. So this is an example, but uh, you, and you, try, you tie also the layers to the, the size, the, you, you tie the size uh, with the, the life cycle of these layers, the one that will change often. You want to have them as soon as possible so that you can go faster to deploy. So um, like I said, in terms of security, uh, this is great because you can easily verify the SHA 256 of each layer each time because each layer is finally, uh, like for Docker, it's just, uh, you, you can describe it as a, a single file. Um, so and if, in addition, we have secure boot, we can also verify authenticity. So we have each time the system boot, we can verify every step of the, of, of the, of the OS of the root file system. Uh, in terms of deployment, of course, it brings uh, good properties because you will download only the layers that really change. And it's really flexible because this layout, you can change it uh, over time. And let's say uh, there is a zero-day uh, issue, uh, zero-day um, vulnerability, sorry. 
I have to deploy, let's say, a bin bash very, very fast. So I don't have to rebuild my whole system. I will just build a very thin layer that brings the, the fix on, on the bash uh, binary. And I will just be able to put, push it very quickly on every aircraft. So uh, this, this design also implements uh, immutability. Um, it's, so in the case of the factory OS, though this one, you know every OS needs to modify files, and you cannot be completely read on it. So there is always a read-write layer on top of the, of the assembly. And uh, in the case of the factory OS, it's a pure RAM memory, so it, it will disappear each time you reboot. So, so it, the factory OS is 100% immutable. And for the what we call the pro sorry the production OS, this one we have to commit files because let's say notably when we we bootstrap communities, it comes with files that have to persist across reboots. So uh, this file will be committed to the flash memory and will be able to yeah, to persist across reboots. Um, but this being said, it's very easy. It comes with good property as well because when you audit all the files inside this uh, layer, you can really understand the way uh, your uh, op operating system modifies uh, its environment. So it's very, very interesting. And uh, you, yeah, so, and uh, it's also very easy to reset. You just wipe everything in this layer and you start from scratch. And notably, because this is a use case as well, when you, when you work on labs with a lot of colleagues, sometimes it's great to just wipe everything and start from scratch. You don't have to spend that much time to, to wonder if you are the guy who did something bad or, or somebody else. So, and finally, if you are able to build this kind of layer, it's very easy to, the same way, of, finally, we, we, we should probably have tried to, to stick to the OCI uh, format. But uh, in this case, this is the way we describe an operating system. So you can see there is a kernel in it from FS, which is the one that actually does the assembly. And, and then you see the three layers, in this case, uh, base root FS, add-ons, and modules. OK. so. Then you have your pipelines that uh, will create all the, these layers. So like I said, they are one, a single file. So in this case, the, these are uh, squash FS files, so read only. And uh, you also have your, your CICD, the, the, the pipelines that will create the manifest that I've just shown you. All of these will be pushed to some artifactory, in our case. And then how do we deploy? It's pretty easy. You have the operation uh, team that will uh, connect to the portal. They will just have to select the OS version plus the aircraft they want to deploy to. Oops. Not my finger. <laughs> OK. Um, and then uh, it's a simplified view, but we have a, um, a service running on ground that will simply uh, take the, this order. It will get the, the manifest and then push it to GitOps. On, on board, on board the aircraft, we have the uh, way to synchronize. Uh, each time the connectivity is available, we synchronize with, with these GitOps. And we have a, a, a systemd service, in this case, that will get the new manifest. If needed, it will grab all the layers that are missing, drop everything into a dedicated partition, and just reboot. So we've been working with this OS for around four years now. And for now, we are still able to install everything with just a reboot. There is no additional uh, phase that may, may, it may come. But for now, we were able to, to go through uh, without that. So still about this OS, just a few remarks. Um, it, when you do GitOps, if you want to reverse, you just create an, another commit that reverses the pre previous one. So it means that you will need to, you will ask to install the previous one. So we always keep the previous version uh, available. And we play with uh, symbolic links to just point to the new one or the, or the previous one. We also have an onboard cache. So yeah, maybe we don't care here, but ways to reduce the connectivity usage. And we have one, one single node fetching everything and sharing with, with the others. OK, so now we have the OS uh, that is, that is uh, up on each blade. And we will now talk about how we bootstrap communities on that. So a bit of requirements first. Uh, we have only five to six nodes available in the, in the ODC, as you can see. So there are more blades, but the others we, you can see after if you want. Some are used for switching. Some are power blades. But it, it turns out you, have, you, you end up with only six nodes available. So you cannot. Uh, spread the role the same way as you would do on ground, where, where you are able to split the control plane, ETCD cluster, and, uh, and the walkers. That's also another big, big, big uh, constraint for us. 
we want uh, this uh, bootstrapping to be as independent and, and as automatic as possible. We cannot rely on the fact that one blade will be available and that I will be able to control from this blade. So we, we want it to be, uh, yeah, kind of really bulletproof because when the operators we come and replace some faulty blade, they, they won't uh, cordon the cluster and do a smart uh, maintenance operation. They will just remove it and plug another, and you're done. So we have to, fit to be able to support that, that use case. Um, yeah. So and our mandate uh, is obviously to bootstrap Kubernetes, but we then have to deploy a couple of services. Uh, we have a CSI storage so that is used because this box provides with um, uh, 96 terabytes of, data, uh, of storage, so we have a way to share it across a uh, cube. Uh, we have a Docker registry. The Alexi will tell you, tell you, tell you more about that after. We have a way also because we do GitOps to encrypt secrets uh, at rest when they are inside the Git repo, and the Flux, uh, the, the continuous deployment, the Flux solution that Alexi also will, will de describe a bit more. So about bootstrapping, we are back in. Um, 2019, so we barely know nothing about cloud technologies, and uh, yeah, we have to start with that. So we start to play with uh, KubeADM. We are uh, we are given advice by people that are more experienced. At this moment, uh, it was a uh, Cube uh, uh, 113. Uh, we play with uh, Cube Spray, which uh, uses uh, Ansible. We use Rancher, K3S, Micro KDS. I don't remember every every everything we we tested. Uh, we obviously also uh, get, got in touch with uh, cloud providers uh, looking for really a turnkey solution. So uh, all the solution, including the, 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 the cloud providers, had great, great solution, but uh, it turns, for the case of the cloud providers, they, they come with specific hardware that will really never fit in our use case. So we ended up with being not, not able to, to find the right solution. Notably, the, I was talking about Ansible and, and, and a few others. They, most of the time, they had a real sequence where you, create, you first create one node and then you, you make the other join. We are not as, and, as independent as we wanted. Uh, moreover, um, some, of, some of them are using a, a pattern where one node will really connect to the other. We have so had a, a grand, um, Cloud provider solution where the, the, the ground was really uh, performing the operation on, on the devices and it, it, it didn't fit uh, our, our use case. So it, it turned out that the only solution that was able to do that off the shelf, even though I know this is not the most trendy uh, technology for now, but was Puppet. So for those who don't know, Puppet is a, a sort of declarative solution, which is always a good thing. Uh, I believe, um, and it works. Its principle is pretty sim yeah, It's pretty simple. You have each node will run a puppet agent, so each agent will collect facts, local facts. So these, if you dump the facts, there is quite a lot. You can uh, add custom facts if you need, and uh, each agent will publish its facts to the to the server. Uh, and while doing that, it also requests a catalog that will be uh, compiled and tuned for the specific agent. So they receive the catalog and then they apply it. So going back to Kubernetes, so uh, Puppet comes with a, a, a Puppet mo a module for Kubernetes. And this one, uh, so the way we implement this kind of independent bootstrap is that because there is a first step that is done before where you use a very simple um, setup file for, for, for this module, for this Puppet Kubernetes module, that will then uh, be managed by a cube tool. And this one just kind of generates all the data you need to be able to, to pre-share with all the nodes so that they can, can kind of get this independence. So uh, I'm talking about, uh, you know, community works uh, with a certificate authority. Each node needs to have a secret and a, and a key, uh, a secret key and a certificate to be able to communicate. So this is a mutual TLS authentication. So this is generated by, by kubetool. This plus a manifest that will describe the role. So if we look on the right, in our case, we have, like I said, we have uh, up to six nodes, but only five will be part of the control plane. You will see that uh, node one, one to five will be control, controller, control plane, and uh, node six will be a uh, worker. And you drop all that into the GitOps, and then Puppet will do the job. 
Um, same thing, we, 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 we do not use kubectool anymore today. We, we, we generate the exact same principle, uh, the same file, our, our own way, because we also have a lot of other secrets to manage, and so we, we automated that task a different way. So is that this magic? Obviously, no. Um, so this is the timeline. Uh, on top, we have node one. So let's say no one is starting. So the kernel starts, then system D starts, and after, after that, the system D starts the Puppet agent. Puppet agent itself, as we want to bootstrap Kubernetes, will run a kube ADM init command. So this node by itself cannot bootstrap Kubernetes because, uh, as, as I explained, there is this static phase where you create all these files. You have to specify your, your control plane. So let's say I have a five node control plane, a single node cannot bootstrap cube. You need to uh, have the quorum that is created. So it's five divided, divided by two plus one. You, you need at least three control plane nodes up to, to be able to make that work. Um, so let's say the second node is coming. So we have a, uh, there is no reason why, but just to highlight the fact that sometimes we cannot rely on the boot order or the sequence of something like that. Uh, node two is arriving. And finally, node three is coming. And if you look, it is only at this precise moment here that we'll have, that we'll have all kubeadm command in it running at the same time. So it is at the only moment that will the cluster will be assembled. Okay, so and what if a fourth node and a fifth node come into the game? This is no problem. In this case, control, uh, the control plane is already assembled, so it will be very fast for this node to, to enter, to join the, the cluster. Um, Okay, so, uh, so it's important to no notice that um, Puppet agent will keep trying to reconcile periodically. But this is something that uh, we changed uh, because we didn't want to, we want to save as much resource as possible and uh, having this reconciliation uh, on a short, short period of time was not, uh, we, was not good for us. So we wanted to at least manage the return code of the Puppet agent and be able to know whether there was no, uh, no change to do at all, it was all set. So in this case, we will back off and, uh, from 30 seconds to five minutes, 10 minutes, and we go up to 30 minutes. Of course, if at this moment a new GitOps, uh, there is new change via GitOps, uh, it, will, um, it will execute immediately uh, to make sure that it's reconciled as soon as possible. There are a few other stuff that we've deployed, that, that we implemented, I, I won't cover because I'm, I'm a bit late, but um, uh, these this, uh, changes we've done are not yet uh, published, but this is something that uh, we have in mind, so we, we just have to do, proceed with that. And now Alexei will explain you how they deploy service, now that I've done my job. <laughs> yeah, so now that we have a Kubernetes cluster that is up and running inside the aircraft, we now need to deploy some workloads. So to understand the challenge that we had to go through, we actually need to understand what is the life cycle of an aircraft. So this is what an aircraft would do over a day, multiple times a day. It will go to an airport, CDG for example, maybe the airport you came through uh, to the KubeCon. It will go to the gate and here I'll have access to uh, some connectivity, 4G, 5G. Some, some of the airports are also equipped with Wi-Fi. Um, then we'll leave the gate, go to the tarmac and take off. Here it'll be too high to have access to solar connectivity, but it'll be too low to have access to satellite connectivity. Then we'll go to cruise uh, above 30,000 feet. Here we'll have access to satellite connectivity, for example. Um, then it will land to another airport, uh, but unfortunately on this airport there is no internet connection because of um, geofencing of, or roaming costs that are too expensive, for example. So what we can see here is that we cannot predict when the aircraft will have access to internet. Uh, we cannot predict when and we cannot predict how it will have access to internet. So the aircraft doesn't have a static IP, we cannot just push software to end configuration to the, to the aircraft. It's up for the aircraft to re realize pretty soon that it will be up for the aircraft to pull its configuration and pull the software. So we're back in 2020, and what we realized is that what we wanted to implement is the GitOps paradigm, and we decided to install Flux inside the cluster to be able to implement this paradigm. But when you install Flux in, in, in the cluster, Flux will pull the Git repository, create the workloads, um, it will create the deployment and the pods, and the container runtime will then pull the container from their registry. But here, we can see that we don't have access to that registry because the aircraft doesn't always have access to internet. Um, so what we realized pretty soon is that most of our pods go, were going image full backups because the container runtime couldn't have access to the registry. 
So we need, we need to find a solution for that. So this is the step-by-step -step process we've been through to make sure that um, when we're installing the workload inside the, the cluster, uh, the image, uh, uh, the pod wouldn't go to image full back off, but we're able to have all the images available. So the first option was pr pretty simple, just install the workloads, uh, let the container runtime pull the container, uh, but it was no extra implementation, but it was definitely not resilient to connectivity loss or to rescheduling. If one of the image was not available on one of the, one of the nodes and we're losing this specific node, then uh, the pod will be rescheduled to a node where the image was not available, so we'd go image pull back off. Um, the second option was to pre-pull every um, images on every node. Uh, that way, uh, every node will have the image available. Um, it was resilient to co connectivity loss because then every image are available everywhere. Uh, but it was very costly in terms of connectivity because we had to pull as many times as we had node every images. And we we're not really able to master the garbage collection. For example, if one of the images were not used for some time, it could be automatically garbage collected. Um, so we need to find a, a better way. So we came up with this uh, component that we called image puller, which goal was to pull the image uh, from our ground registry to our onboard registry that we've, de what, that we've deployed. Uh, it was based on the manifest, like a Scopia manifest that we've built, and it was stored on the same um, GitOps repository as the Flux resources. Um, so it was very efficient. We were only pulling the image once, so it's, it was cost efficient. Every image were cached on board on that registry, and we couldn't master the garbage collection because this specific component could master and delete the, 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 the image that were not used. Um, but we were facing some race condition with um, Flux installing the workloads at the same time that we're actually pulling the container. Uh, because th that, that, that manifest that was describing all the, all the image pull to, to, to pull were actually on the same Git repository as Flux resources. Um, one of the possible fix were to disable uh, the Flux automatic reconciliation. And so we could like uh, tell Flux, I have all the images and then now you can start reconciliation, do the reconciliation. Uh, but what we're like with Flux is that it's always trying uh, to make sure that the current state of the cluster is in phase uh, with the expected state of the cluster. So we still need to find a better solution. But you can ask, why is it that important to, to avoid image pull back off? Because on the last solution I presented, it was just the image pull back off for just for a transitional time. Um, when uh, the image puller were, were pulling the image, then it would be available. So it, it was just a short period of time. Well, there are three main reasons for that. The first one is that the Ionic A Ring 667-2 guidelines actually recommend to segregate the software download phase and the software installation phase, which were not the case here because the, our component was pulling the image at the same time our, as Flux were installing the workloads. Um, the second one is not to disturb the passenger experience. Uh, even with that transitional state, we could have some uh, disruption on the on the on the passenger experience. The third um, the third item is the the most important one. We couldn't afford to install an, only a portion of the microservice and then lost connectivity for uh, a day or an hour or or even more. Um, so we need we li really needed to make sure that all images were cached and available on board be be before starting to implement to to install the workloads. So we came up with that custom operator called image puller operator. So the image puller operator is a custom Kubernetes operator, a operator uh, which goal is to synchro synchronize container images from one source registry to a destination registry. And it's based on two custom resources, OCI registry and image. So an OCI registry, as you can see right here, describe a registry with some credential to access this registry and the URL. And an image describe um, uh, an image to pull from a registry, from a source registry, to a destination registry. So how that how that works in in real life. So um, let's say on the on, on on the left we have our platform registry uh, on the ground with our container image to pull, and on the left we have our uh, onboard Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes cluster. Um, we have our onboard registry that we've deployed um, we're using the operating system, and we have our image pool operator. We've defined on the cluster our custom resources, so platform registry uh, uh, with the associated credential, uh, which refers to our ground platform registry, and the onboard registry with the associated credential. 
and then we are cre we've created our um, image object, which is, which is referencing the platform registry as a source and the destination registry, uh, the onboard registry as a destination. Then the image reconciliation loop will start. First, um, the image will restart to reconcile the resource. It will get all the information related to this image, so the destination, the source registry and the credential, the destination registry and the credential. And then it will start pulling the container, pushing, pushing it to the onboard registry, and update the status. This last part, updating the status, is the most important one. So if we take a look at the status, we're actually using the case status standard which means that Flux will be able to understand that the, this resource is healthy or not based on the, on the ready um, condition. So now that we have the operator, how do we actually make sure that all the image are pulled on board and before letting Flux installing the workload? So this is the architect, a simple view of our uh, onboard um, GitOps uh, repository. So we have one customization that is describing images and one customization that is describing releases. If we take a look at the customization, for image, it's actually installing all the, the resources that, I, that are defined here. And as you can imagine, we're defining on this folder image resources. And we can see that we're using the wait condition to make sure that before this customization will be considered as healthy, all resources, all images need to be considered uh, healthy, so which means every images need to be pulled on board. Then we have our uh, release uh, customization, which is uh, a bunch of Elm release. And you can see here that this layer actually depends on the image layer, which means this release layer will not be reconciled unless the image layer is actually healthy. So if we take a look back of our, in our cluster, so uh, still we have our onboard, our platform registry with, with some um, uh, container images. We have our onboard registry, image puller, operator, and flux, which will, so yeah. Flux will then create, create the customization, our image layer and our release layer. You can see here that the release layer will not start being reconciled because it depends on the image layer. The image layer will then create our image objects and then our image pull over operator will start to work. So we'll reconcile, pull, push, update the status. Nice, nice, it's healthy. We'll do the same for the red image. It will uh, reconcile, pull, push the image and then update the status. Then every um, images are healthy, um, so then the layer will actually be healthy, which means it will it will unlock the the release layer, and then Flux will then start actually um, uh, deploying the the resources that are defined on the on the on this uh, release layer. The release layer will then create the M release, which will create the pods, and then the pods will be able to pull the image from the onboard registry, and then we can see, and then it will be healthy, and then everything is healthy. So thanks to that, we've been able to sequence the installation of the, of the, of the resources, making sure that every container images have been pulled on board before uh, actually letting Flux installing the, the workloads. I didn't dare to do a live demo, so I'm just gonna show a, a recording. So um, on the top left, we're, we have our customization. On the top right, we have our custom resources image. On the bottom left, we have our uh, M releases. And on the bottom right, we have our pods. So here, we're creating our um, uh, customization. We have our image um, uh, layer and our release layer. You can see here that, for some reason, the image layer starts first which will create then our uh, images. Uh, our image polar priority is now reconciling the resources. You can see that it's not ready now, uh, but it's start to reconcile, uh, it was very fast. Um, now that all the images has, has been pulled on board, so our image polar operator has pulled the container from, from our ground registry, pushed it on board, and then updated the status of the image. Back. And then you can see that the the, um, the release layer will then um, start to be reconciled. Yep, I need to wait. You cannot fail, it's a video. It's a video, you cannot <laughs> fail. Yeah, here. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, the real sayer will then will then start to be reconciled at the same time. But you, you can see that there it's the depend the dependency on the image library is actually not ready. So we don't have any MREs that are currently installed because uh, it, yeah, there's a dependency that is not that is not uh, um, uh, re done. So if we wait a little bit, we'll see that the image layer will not be healthy because every image has been reconciled. And then the, the release layer will then uh, start as uh, its dependency on the image layer has been fulfilled. It will create, create the Elm release. Um, the um, Elm uh, controller will then install the Elm release, create the pods. And then, yeah, as you can see over here, uh, the, the MRs are being reconciled. Um, the pods can start without any image build back up because we've, been, we've made sure that all the, um, the image has been uh, cached on the onboard registry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it, it was a recording, so. <laughs> <laughs> A uh, couple of takeaways from this presentation. Um, what we've realized working on this project is that every off-the-shelf technology that you'll find, the CNCF has a huge landscape of technology you can use. But when it comes to edge computing, it's not always that easy to use those technology, uh, especially when you're uh, working in an environment with, with partial connectivity or no remote or physical access. You have to deal with the, those different technology and, and tweak it a little bit sometimes to make it work. Um, the second takeaway is because we don't have remote access or physical access to the cluster, it's flying in, in, inside the aircraft. Every single action that we're doing needs to be automated. We talked about uh, bootstrapping the cluster, installing the software, but, but it goes way beyond than this. Uh, every action like database administration or self-healing, all of that needs to be automated um, somehow to make sure that everything we want on the cluster uh, will be available. Um, uh, the uh, operator that we presented is not open source yet, but we plan on uh, making it open source. Uh, if we do, it will be available on the um, Talis Group uh, um, GitHub account. And if you want to see it closer, uh, it will be available on the Talis booth on K34. Thank you. Thank you.